Hello everybody, just before we get started I want to say that this is something entirely new, a regular Today I Found Out video will follow, so do not worry if you're looking for your TIFO fix, that will come later today. For now this is a new experimental series of videos we're trying, it's called This Day in History, and if you couldn't guess from the title we're looking at this day in history. This is June the 1st. So let's crack on. I'd love to know what you think. Let me know in the comments below. Also give it a like if you like it. You know, it's all a work in progress. So let us know how we're doing. So today we're looking at the Heimlich maneuver. Well, according to various interviews that he gave in his lifetime, he passed away in 2016 at the age of 96, the eponymous maneuver he championed in the 1970s is responsible for saving the lives of tens of thousands of people and also not an insignificant number of dogs. The genesis of the Heimlich maneuver can be traced all the way back to 1972. This was when Dr. Heimlich, who was a Cincinnati-based thoracic surgeon at the time, he actually got fired a couple of years later, read an article in the New York Times that revealed that over 3,000 people in the United States had died from choking on food in that year alone. At the time, the general consensus among medical professionals was that the best way for the layman to help a choking person was to slap them very hard on the back a few times. Now, Heimlich, being an expert on all things chest-related, reasoned that a better method would be to more directly leverage the air in the lungs to force the blockage out. Basically, if you put pressure on the lungs, the sealed balloon-like organ would naturally provide the force necessary to dislodge the food. To test this hypothesis, he couldn't exactly go around getting humans to choke on things, so Heimlich started to do this to beagles, which is apparently a dog that humans just love torturing. If you want to know more about that, do have a Google around beagle smoking. Now, specifically, Heimlich and his team they put small tubes in the dog's throat that made it difficult, if not impossible, for them to breathe. So once he got these dogs to be choking, initially he experimented with pressure to the chest in order to expel the tube, but he found this pretty ineffective. Heimlich noticed then that if he pressed on the dog's diet, diaphragm just right, thus compressing its lungs, the tube would sometimes be violently dislodged. Indeed, this was so violent that he noted that on some of the test runs, the tube would actually fly out of the dog's mouth and several feet across the room. Now, you might at this point be wondering if things ever really went wrong in this experiment, which resulted in the significant harm or the death of a dog. Well, Heimlich actually claims that none of the dogs suffered any lasting injury, and the removal of the tube was always a straightforward process. You just had to grab it out of the mouth whenever things got dicey. All right, so after perfecting the technique for dislodging the tubes, Heimlich then began a slightly more dangerous procedure, giving the dogs comically large chunks of meat eat, meat that they occasionally choked on, which allowed him to perform the technique under more realistic conditions. Again, at this point, we should point out that he does claim that no dogs were permanently hurt as a result of his experimentation. So after adapting the technique for humans, Heimlich felt that this method needed to be widely disseminated in order to save lives. Normally, you know, there would be that whole process of going through medical research, publishing a peer-reviewed study, etc, etc, etc. But essentially, the good doctor felt that he needed to get this information out into the world as quickly as possible so it would start saving lives. And so it was that on this day in history, that's June 1, 1974, Heimlich published an article titled Pop Goes the Café Coronary in Emergency Medicine. For reference here, a café coronary was just a bit of a slang way of saying cardiac arrest as a result of choking on food. Heinrich then went on to pull a few strings and get a friend who wrote for the Chicago Daily News to get the article published there as well, with the friend explicitly noting, Dr. Heimlich doesn't know that this method will save a choking person, but then goes on to recommend it anyway. Actually, in the original article, Heimlich noted that it's been tested only on dogs, but I believe the logic of the concept and the favorable findings warrant public dissemination. He then goes on to state, since aspiration must occur during inspiration in order for the bolus to be sucked against the laryngeal orifice, the victim's lungs are expanded at the time of the accident. Actually, there is always residual air in the lung, so sudden forceful compression of the lungs will increase the air pressure within the trachea and larynx and thus eject the offending bolus like the cork from a champagne bottle. There, in short, are the dynamics of the procedure and here's how to do it. 
Standing behind the victim, the rescuer puts both arms around him just above the belt line, allowing head, arms, and upper torso to hang forward. Then, grasping his own right wrist with his left hand, the rescuer rapidly and strongly presses into the victim's abdomen, forcing the diaphragm upward, compressing the lungs, and expelling the obstructing bolus. The same effect can be obtained with the victim lying face down on the floor and the rescuer sitting astride the victim's lower torso or buttocks. If, however, the victim is already lying on his back, he needs didn't be moved. The victim merely sits astride him and suddenly presses both hands, one on top of the other, forcefully into the upper subdiaphragmatic abdominal region. We cannot be certain, of course, that the experimental results will be duplicated in humans, but when tracheostomy is not feasible, there is certainly no risk in recommending that the procedure be tried in actual cafe coronary emergencies, since an unaided victim will die in minutes. Then, as experiences are reported, the method can be evaluated. Only by disseminating public information about this simple technique can we determine whether it will result in a significant reduction of what amounts to 3,900 totally avoidable deaths every year. So this article, or snippets of it, they quickly got republished in hundreds of newspapers throughout the United States. Within weeks, reports began pouring in from people across the United States about how this technique was saving lives. Later that year, the Journal of the American Medical Association called Heimlich and told him they were going to name the technique after him. After vetoing the name the Heimlich Method, Heimlich settled on the Heimlich Maneuver, which he felt was more appropriate. Naturally, given a lack of hard evidence supporting his method in favor of existing recommendations, institutions such as the American Red Cross chose not to initially recommend the Heimlich Maneuver, which in turn caused Heimlich to decide to market it himself, including selling shirts and posters and even going on the Tonight Show to demonstrate it on Golden Globe Award winner Angie Dickinson. Alright, so at this point in our story, you might be wondering if this method is actually superior to the former widespread recommendation of just hard back slaps. Now, despite what you might think in the popularity of the Heimlich Maneuver today, it's actually remarkably difficult to say. But on the other hand, testing it in a scientifically ethical manner would be really tricky, so that's also not really possible. So despite that, let's see if we can look into some statistics. When Heimlich first got his bright idea, a little over 3,000 people per year were dying from choking in the US. In the two decades following the widespread use of the Heimlich Maneuver, the number of choking deaths in the US stayed approximately the same. Later in 2000, there was actually a rather curious jump from 1995's 3,185 to 2000's 4,313 deaths. The number stayed mostly stable until 2010, when it further jumped to 4,570, with it rising a bit since then. Indeed, the high point of choking deaths in the United States occurred in 2015, when 5,051 people died. So, given this lack of hard evidence supporting Heimlich over backslaps, starting in 2006, the American Red Cross, besides still recommending first that the person try to cough it up if they can and having someone call 911, they actually switched back to recommending backslaps before trying the Heimlich maneuver and then alternating between the two at five times each. As for the reason for adding the backslaps back in, according to American Red Cross representative Mike Higgins, Red Cross officials determined that, to quote, the body of scientific evidence now states that the use of more than one method is most effective in helping a person who has an obstructed airway. Now, of note here is that the American Red Cross, while being a very reputable organization, is not a part of the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. This is the group that most all trained emergency medical providers throughout the world use when recommending guidelines for treating people in emergency situations. On that note, the American Heart Association, which is a part of the previously mentioned group, recommends that in choking situations, both medical professionals and laymen perform the Heimlich maneuver on a conscious person and chest compressions, the same ones as used in CPR, on an unconscious person. If this is unsuccessful at dislodging said blocking object, medical professionals are then trained to essentially cut a hole in the neck, which is of course something that an untrained person should not try. Alright, so choking on something is all good, but what if you're at home eating by yourself and you start to choke? Well, researchers at the Royal Brompton Hospital did find that self-administered abdominal thrusts actually produce as much intrathoracic pressure as when someone else does it. For maximum effect, they found that doing the abdominal thrusts via forcibly collapsing your abdomen on the back of a chair provided the highest pressure of all. All right, so let's take it back to back slaps and the Red Cross recommendations. Heimlich stated, I have no desire to diminish the good work that the American Red Cross has done, such as in times of natural disasters, but telling people to hit a choking person on the back could potentially lead to death. The Red Cross should do what the American Heart Association does, 
recommend the Heimlich maneuver. He then went on to elaborate, It's been scientifically proven that hitting a choking person on the back can drive an object that is partially blocking the airway more deeply into the throat. It is not entirely clear as to what studies he's actually referring to that proved this scientifically. That said, at least when talking about comparing the two with regard to internal pressure, a 1982 Yale study choking the Heimlich abdominal thrust versus back blows, an approach to measurement of inertial and aerodynamic forces, determined that the Heimlich maneuver produces significantly more intrathoracic pressure than back slaps. It is noted, however, that this study was something funded by the Dysphagic Foundation Incorporated of Cincinnati Incorporated, which was later renamed to the Heimlich Institute. That being said, just because Heimlich helped fund the study doesn't necessarily mean that the results were inaccurate, and the three Yale researchers involved, Richard L. Day, Edmund S. Krellin, and Arthur B. Du Bois, would later state that their research was completely independent, with no oversight or pressure from Heimlich. Du Bois further stated that the experiment was rather straightforward and easily verifiable by others, simply measuring air pressure out of the mouths of subjects when the researchers performed back blows and abdominal thrusts. In response, representatives from the Red Cross noted that the point of the back blow is more for the jarring effect that can dislodge the stuck object, rather than creating an artificial cough which can increase the air pressure which can dislodge the object. It is for this reason that they recommend trying both methods. As for one, Dr. Roger White of the Mayo Clinic and the American Heart Association, he states of his opinion of Heimlich and his work, There was never any science here. Heimlich overpowered science all along the way with his slick tactics and intimidation, and everyone, including us at the AHA, caved in. Heimlich's son, Peter Heimlich, also has less than glowing reviews of his father's assertion, stating his father was a spectacular con man and serial liar. Peter has since dedicated years of his life to debunking many of the things that Dr. Heimlich would say publicly. That said, it is almost universally thought among medical professionals that the Heimlich maneuver is a fantastic tool for helping choking victims until medical professionals arrive. And as noted, even those medical professionals will usually start by attempting the Heimlich maneuver or chest compressions. But while the Heimlich maneuver itself has been a boon to the world of choking victims, earning Heimlich more than a little positive fame, Heimlich's later career was marked with controversy owing to doing things like publicly championing the Heimlich maneuver to help people suffering from asthma attacks, heart attacks, and cystic fibrosis, as well as advocating its use with drowning victims. Actually, though, the last one there, it kind of caught on for a while, owing to seemingly make sense on the surface, trying to force the water that had got into the lungs out. However, the American Red Cross Advisory Council notes of this, Studies have shown that there is no need to clear the airway of aspirated water. Only a modest amount of water is aspirated by the majority of drowning victims, and it is rapidly absorbed into the central circulation. Thus, it does not act as an obstruction in the trachea. An attempt to remove water from the breathing passages by any means other than suction are unnecessary and potentially dangerous. The danger here is noted as potentially causing physical injury, vomiting, and potential subsequent aspiration, and the fact that doing this delays the gold standard recommendation to the public here in cases of an unconscious drowning victim who isn't breathing, that's CPR, until professional medical aid arrives or the person is revived. Although, to be fair here, proper administration of CPR is also guaranteed to cause physical injury via breaking the cartilage that attaches the ribs to the sternum in an attempt to compress the heart. But at least in the case of CPR, it's for a proven effective purpose. As with its use in aiding choking victims, it doesn't appear as if Heimlich took the time to do the necessary research to definitively show that the Heimlich maneuver is actually more helpful than standard recommendations in these cases before widely publicizing his discovery. This was succinctly pointed out by cardiologists Dr. Joseph Ornato, who stated of the controversy, Dr. Heimlich is trying to force the medical community to adopt a measure that is lacking in adequate scientific foundation. But if studies show he is right, I'd be the first one to want to apply it. Later on in his life, and much more controversially, Heimlich, in conjunction with the Heimlich Institute and doctors from China and Ethiopia, were intentionally infecting people that had AIDS with malaria and then not treating them for the malaria until the disease had progressed to a critical state. Known as malariotherapy, the idea here was to try and cure the person of AIDS by raising the body temperature to extreme levels via a malaria-induced fever for an extended period of time. These extreme high fevers would potentially be 
allowed to be maintained for weeks without treatment. The idea was that the HIV virus would be unable to survive such a scenario. Indeed, this wasn't actually without precedent. In 1927, this was a Nobel Prize winning treatment for syphilis, but in this case, the experiments the Heimlich Institute were involved in were considered too dangerous and unethically administrated, and indeed, there was very little hope that they'd actually do anything beneficial at all. Heimlich's response to this was, if all of your peers understand what you've done, you haven't been creative. So that was the first episode in a new series that we're experimenting with. It's called Today in History. This was June the 1st. And if you'd like to see more of this and how we're doing in this series, let us know. Comments below. Use those. And as always, thanks for watching.